Welcome to The Conspiracy Show. My name is Richard Serrett. Vaccines are supposed to prevent disease through low exposures to the diseases themselves. We're generally shown statistics to prove that vaccines are safe and effective, and we are assured that despite the fact some vaccinations occasionally produce side effects, the benefits outweigh the risks. However, some researchers and anti-vaccine groups point to what they say is an emerging body of evidence that indicate vaccines can damage a child's developing immune system and brain, leading to debilitating and life-threatening disorders like autism, ADHD, asthma, peanut allergies, juvenile diabetes, or SIDS, death itself. On this episode of The Conspiracy Show, we'll meet an investigative journalist who has researched the history and development of vaccines, and she maintains vaccines are neither safe nor effective. We'll meet a medical reporter who characterizes the relationship between vaccine manufacturers and government vaccine policymakers and physicians as disturbing. We'll meet a natural health physician in Florida who insists that diseases for which vaccines are currently used had already decreased by approximately 80% from the 1800s before vaccines were introduced. And we'll meet a national newspaper columnist and author who says the greatest risk to public health is posed not by vaccines, but the hysterical, uninformed anti-vaccine movement. Me? I'm just like you. I want the truth, and I'm willing to follow it wherever it leads. It is time to redefine reality. Genetic enigma or a human alien hybrid. There was at least two gunmen, one was firing from the nose. Is it possible technology can alter weather patterns? Created by the corporation. Has been engineered by the Illuminati? There's no doubt. There has never been a correctly done long term study to test the safety and the efficacy of any vaccine. How do vaccines work? Why are they so injurious? How do they work? Well, they're injurious because, first of all, whatever you're putting into the body is bypassing all the normal, many of the normal lines of defense of the immune system. Sydney White is a longtime investigative journalist. She teaches a free lecture series, Studies in Propaganda, at the Free University of Toronto. Sydney, welcome to The Conspiracy Show. Thank you. Vaccines, very controversial topic. Are they safe? No. And why not? It's not really controversial. There's so much evidence and history that says they're not safe. No, they're not safe. They've been promoted as being safe. In 1788, uh, the Lancet showed a photograph of a tombstone where the parents are mourning their son of 17 years old and on the tombstone it says that he was killed by an inoculation. You're putting the germ that you're placing in the vaccine on purpose, the one you're trying to make the person immune to, you're injecting that directly in. And then there's other germs in the manufacturing process that inevitably get in there that you don't even know about. They're going in there too. One thing is that they have all these disgusting ingredients in them. The, the, the heavy metals are just, just uh, very, very toxic. And there are viral components as well. Often there are diseases that come from the tissues upon which the vaccines are cultured. Formaldehyde, carcinogenic, polysorbate 80, can cause strokes, can cause long, can cause cancer. Uh, aside from that, there's antifreeze. Aluminum, mercury, heavy metals. Everyone knows that that's, that's toxic. So they're injected directly into the body. Yeah, this is not a good idea. But I happen to know that there was a meeting in Geneva of the World Health Organization after this where they said, we will not use this vaccine ever again. Why? Because it had caused cases of smallpox.
Still, there are a number of board-certified uh, physicians, including uh, people like Dr. Russell Blaylock, who is a neurosurgeon, who speak out against the safety and efficacy of vaccines. What do you make of, of them? There is no doubt that there are some risks associated with some vaccines. Uh, in some cases, they cause extremely rare neurological disorders, uh, or uh, because it, it might be done with a live culture, it, in, in some cases, will give you the disease it's supposed to, it's meant to protect you from. However, in, as with all public health programs in modern democracies, uh, the, the epidemiology of this is rigorously tested before people pr provide it with vaccines. Polysorbate 80, which is a chemical in a number of vaccines, assists getting substances across the blood-brain barrier. The swelling of the brain becomes too great because the entrance of the chemicals was so quick, shuts down areas of the brain, causes deprivation of oxygen. It's horrendous. Now, a child builds its immunity slowly. Each time it comes up to a germ, conquers that germ, it goes into the hard files. The body says, aha, I know that one now. And the next time, same thing. The body does that because the child's immune system, once he's off the breast, he has no immune protection from his mother. Last year, one in 67 uh, children in U.S. schools were diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. And yet, among unvaccinated children, that number is less than one in a thousand. So the chances of that having nothing to do with vaccines is one in several trillion. It's a pity that um, very few of us could, could uh, tell you the name of the person who invented a smallpox vaccination. Uh, but that is a public health initiative that saved millions and millions and millions of lives. Smallpox vaccine was invented in England by Edward Jenner. He thought that if you took pus from a cow and you opened the flesh of somebody and you rubbed that pus in there, this was the first vaccine, right? that they would miraculously be immune to smallpox. When smallpox vaccine was forcefully mandated in London. And over those 12 years, smallpox increased 20-fold. It caused epidemics. And after the worst one of 23,000 in England, they made it compulsory. Everyone fought it, just like now we're fighting it. The people in England fought it then, but it didn't get cleared until 1948. And then it was no longer compulsory. In the Philippines, they gave 95% of the population a triple dose of the smallpox vaccine. There wasn't a bigger epidemic on the globe. There were cities, research has shown, where they did not vaccinate very much at all, hardly any smallpox. This was during the epidemic. There were other cities where they vaccinated a great deal tremendous outbreaks of smallpox after the vaccinations. It was a very uneven history. It didn't prove they wiped it out at all. The World Health Organization claimed they wiped it out in Africa in the mid-1970s. But I happen to know that there was a meeting in Geneva of the World Health Organization after this where they said, this is a private meeting, we will not use this vaccine ever again. Why? because it had caused cases of smallpox. Smallpox has essentially been eradicated from the face of the earth, but um, what happened was, because smallpox was eliminated and because other diseases like it were eliminated, we've come to take those life-saving technologies for granted. University of Michigan sponsored the largest clinical trial that's ever been done on anything. And uh, that was on the, the, the polio vaccine, on the Salk vaccine. In 1957, after the, a couple of years after the Salk vaccine had been released on the public, the polio rates had skyrocketed. They'd gone up. So what happened was there was a reclassification of polio. Polio was no longer, um, you know, neck pain, headache, photophobia and fever with 12 hours of uh, any kind of paralysis. It then had to be 30 days of paralysis. And that cut out about 98% of, of cases. They changed the definition of the disease 
to exclude many people who could have been diagnosed before makes it look like the number of cases is now going down after the vaccine was introduced. And so the people who had uh, less than 30 days of paralysis were then called aseptic meningitis. Plus you've got the fact that the disease was already on the decline before the vaccine was ever introduced, which is the case with a number of diseases. It's not the story we've been told about wiping out polio. The aseptic meningitis diagnoses went through the roof and polio plummeted. And, and really that's the history of polio. Our thinking becomes unbalanced in a way that we emphasize the sometimes imaginary risks of these vaccines while completely ignoring the, the decades and decades and decades of public health benefits that we've received from this, these vaccines. They want to make it absolutely mandatory for every child in the United States to get 33 vaccines in early childhood. And that is going to spell the end of health as we know it in America. That's going to be the end. What is the, the danger of a vaccine? What, do, what does it do once it enters the body? Babies can be drained of their vitamin C levels. If they have low enough vi vitamin C levels, what happens is, is they go into acute scurvy. This is something called Barlow syndrome. When that happens, they can start bleeding. And if it's a pertussis vaccine, which is well known for making the brain swell, and the brain swell uh, often causes the baby to uh, emit a high-pitched high scream. When that's going on, if the vitamin C levels are so low that they start ble bleeding, then uh, the brain can start bleeding. They can get subdural hematoma. It's a shock to the body. The body doesn't know what's going on here. I got 16 different things here I'm dealing with. Chemicals, germs, it's been injected. The body doesn't really know how to respond to that. You have to understand what's in a vaccine. What a vaccine does is it traumatizes the immune system. And the, it has RNA, foreign, DNA, foreign, animal DNA. Now when especially the RNA and the DNA clutches onto the protein, then your body starts to conflict with that, your immune system will start to fight that, and that's how they get the autoimmune diseases. A couple of years ago, a court order went out in Maryland where unvaccinated children were ordered to be brought to a courthouse where they were virtually vaccinated, multiple times in some cases, on the spot. How can that happen in a democracy? It happens because it's not a democracy. <laughs> it happens because the government Public health authorities decide, we've had enough of this. I'm in charge, you're the underling, I'm the boss, and now I'm gonna do everything I can to get you. And if this requires dragging parents and their children to a courthouse because a judge ordered it and getting them vaccinated, somebody's gonna do that somewhere along the line because that's the way these people think and feel and operate. They do wanna make no loopholes they want to make it absolutely mandatory for every child in the United States to get 33 vaccines in early childhood. And that is going to spell the end of health as we know it in America. That's going to be the end. When I was a kid in school, there were two, maybe three mandatory childhood vaccines, polio, mumps, measles. Now, in the United States, for example, there are 22 mandatory childhood vaccines. Do you find that at all worrisome? It does seem scary if you just look at the sheer numbers. Um, however, we have a massive public health medical bureaucracy that has checked the safety of every single one of those vaccines. And you could argue, well, I don't want my child to have 27 vaccines, you know, I'll stick to the, the three or four that he or she really needs. But then eventually you'll get situations where children at a school will be afflicted with a disease that could have been prevented with a vaccine. It's been exposed fairly recently that the US government has actually paid out claims 
from parents whose child, children were vaccine damaged and developed autism. The government has paid those parents money under its vaccine compensation program, while at the same time out front saying there's absolutely no connection between vaccines and autism. Why are you paying out the claims then? If you look at some of the people who've made claims uh, that vaccines are bad for your health, the most famous example being Dr. Wakefield in England, who uh, first published the 1998 study that alleged that there was a, a possible connection between uh, autism and, and vaccines. Ultimately, he was found to fail the, the peer review standard because The Lancet, which was the journal in which he published his research, uh, showed that his research was wrong, and in recent years they've, they've shown that it's debunked. That, to me, is the kind of test that public health research should be subject to. Uh, Wakefield may be right because Big Pharma has a lot of money, and there may have been a small technicality that allowed them to say there was no connection, but when you think about the 20 and 30 years where these same paid doctors and surgeon generals said there was no connection between smoking and cancer, please, this, this is not the first time that paid scientists will tell you there's no connection between uh, certain objects when really you find out in the end there are. The desire to be skeptical of medications sometimes leads to hysterical incidents in which people are scared into not using safe medications such as the MMR vaccine. And the, the situation with Dr. Wakefield is this paradigmatic example where you had the safe vaccine and you had large group of, of parents in developed countries who decided not to use it because of information they read on the internet and as a result children's lives were put at risk. Government officials and a lot of uh, pediatricians are very very compassionate and they speak with compassion they speak with certainty but they clearly haven't read the source documents and the source uh, studies. Can we trust then the, the peer-reviewed journals, the New England Journal of Medicine and Lancet and others? Not really, not really. You have to do your own research. You have to ask one question first. Who paid for it? The vaccine programs are only implemented when there is a clear benefit in excess of the cost. The only exception I've seen to this is, for instance, the H1N1 vaccines. After the fact, they showed that the effectiveness in some cases was, was pretty limited. It didn't mean that the vaccines were actually causing people to have serious diseases. It just meant that the effect of the effectiveness of it was, was much lower than they, they had thought. They're not going to tell you who paid for it, but this should be your very first question. And you don't have to be an investigative journalist. You can be a parent. Informed consent means you have to give your consent to the doctor to do what he's going to do, and you have to be informed. The information is there, but people don't read it. They just believe what they're told, and they firmly believe what they're told. And I'm sure that a lot of uh, government officials and a lot of uh, pediatricians are very, very compassionate, and they speak with compassion, they speak with certainty, but they clearly haven't read the source documents and the source uh, studies. So yes, we all have to start doing research about things we care about, our bodies. Your body is the only thing between you and eternity. Take care of it. Research. I would urge them to get their information from their doctor. Uh, and I would urge their doctor to get their information from peer-reviewed literature. I don't think there's any difference between this and other fields that our, our, our system of, of, of science and public health relies on a system of peer review in scientific publication. After a close review of more than 1,000 research studies, a U.S. federal panel of experts recently concluded that vaccines cause very few side effects and found no evidence that vaccines cause autism or type 1 diabetes. The report was issued by the Institute of Medicine. 
part of the National Academies of Sciences, and is the first comprehensive report on vaccine side effects since 1994. Of course, for those in the anti-vaccine movement, the review is only further evidence of a conspiracy on the part of the government and the mainstream scientific medical community. That leaves the rest of us to sort through the mountains of information, both pro and anti-vaccine, and decide for ourselves. The question as to whether to have your children vaccinated or not is one of the most important decisions you will make as a parent. Any medical procedure or treatment, including vaccination, requires informed consent, emphasis on the informed. There are no shortcuts to knowledge. If you want to reach the castle, you have to swim the moat. Good luck. And now, I'd like to know what you think. You can contact me here at The Conspiracy Show through the website, www.theconspiracyshow.com. In the meantime, don't be afraid.